Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Dancy. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk to you about uh, history of the occult and technology downloading paganism. I'm kind of shocked I didn't think anybody would come to this topic. Um, this is the latest in a series of topics that I've been uh, working on for the last decade. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those tomorrow during my keynote. First off, can everyone hear me in the back or who wants to hear me? Okay. Uh, second off, um, I don't care if you use your devices, if you listen to music, if you ignore everything, or you get up and leave in the middle. I'm totally cool. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-device, so if you want to use your tech, go for it. Um, there's too much technology shaming going on in the world right now, uh, and I'm not going to be that person that tells you you're bad because you're not paying attention to me. Um, but I wanted to talk about this and kind of get your feedback on this topic, because uh, I'm going to talk about some things in here I've never said publicly. Uh, I didn't want to say them uh, before my book came out, because publishers can pull books very quick nowadays. Um, and then uh, secondly, kind of understand where you're coming from and what brought some of you guys here. What brought you guys here? If I can just get one or two of you to share why you thought this would be interesting, because there's a lot of actually really good stuff going on right now. Anybody want to be socially brave and tell me why you came? Very cool. <laughs> so I'm going to share that back if that's okay. And I'm going to paraphrase. So <laughs> this gentleman has a significant other who studied anthropology, I think you said. And he found it really interesting. And he thought this was a kind of a di different topic than what was going on. Anyone else? Why would you come to an, a, a talk on the occult? some broaden, broaden the palette of information. Um, good, good. One more, maybe? Just someone? So now it's burning inside one of you. I can feel it. You like the title, okay. Good, good clickbait for the conference, right? I hate conferences that do that. Okay, I do, it just makes me, I don't even go to those sessions if, you're, if it's too punchy. Um, I wanted to talk about magic and technology because there were a few things happening in the world that I think are very systemically linked to this concept of technology and magic. The first one is something I call identity collapse. Um, as we've become digitized, I've noticed that our personalities are being splintered by the systems that we're put in. One of the things I found in my own experience over the last 10 years of being digitized, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow morning, is the idea that when you can push your identity into an interface or into a system, it's very easy to pull out anything you need from it. It's kind of like scrying. The other thing is I'm starting to see what I've called now for about three years time collapse. So it's this concept that no matter where I go in the world, time has kind of fallen away from the constructs of reality. Um, people can sense time in one another. Um, I've also noticed that some businesses and institutions are starting to make time almost irrelevant. And again, I'm finding that technology is reshaping how we just think about the temporal nature of everything from waiting in line to needing something. Um, obviously, with things like climate collapse, you can also totally get rid of time as far as seasons and things. Um, something that I've been really, really worried about is this rage contagion that I see spreading. And I'm sorry if there's misspellings in here. I did this uh, late when I was thinking about, well, I need to tell them why I want to talk about this. But I've noticed this virility that's spreading, this anger, this hostility that jumps from person to person. There are a lot of subreddits and uh, forums online where you can see this type of... Um, this, and when I say anger, I literally mean physical violence uh, that's erupting. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to talk about this because I feel there's a, an extreme burden of death and existentialism that I'm finding pervasive in the people that I talk to. They almost look dead in their eyes. Um, and I think part of this is coming from this, these, these things, the identity collapse, the time collapse, and this rage contagion. So I'm going to ask you guys for a second. I'd like you all to... You don't have to close your eyes, but you can metaphorically close your eyes. And I want you to think of what you see when I say the word magic. So just think of what you say when you hear the word magic. 
What type of images pop in your head? Just think of them. Okay, now, I want you to raise your hand if I mention anything that you thought of when I said the word magic. Who thought of uh, a magician with a hat? A bunch of you. Who thought of like a wizard or a dragon or something mystical? Some more of you. Anyone think of anything else? Harry Potter, I actually had that down. That was someone we'd got in the past. Dumbledore, yeah. He's my favorite. Uh, but then again, I'm a little gay bear. So um, I shouldn't say that out loud. Um, so uh, some things that people normally think of when we say this word is, like we said, magicians. Sometimes they'll think of spiritual items like rocks, um, wizards, uh, or even Harry Potter. And it was hard to create a Harry Potter icon for those. Um, but, but when we think about magic, um, usually most people, when they think about magic and technology, go right back to Arthur C. Clarke's saying that any su sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I was born in 1968, and the first time I heard this quote was probably in the middle 80s, and I was really moved by it because I got my first computer in 1977, and I was instantly hooked. Um, today, if you go to Google and you search for just the two words, most connected, I come right up in like 41 countries as the world's most connected man. Uh, but I'd like to tell you today at this conference for the first time, I'm also a witch. And I've been a practicing digital witch for about three years now. And I'm going to share with you some of the spells I've done and some of the programming I've done to cast spells on the people around me. Interested? Good. So a little bit more about me and my background. Between 2008 and 2009, I used something called Yahoo Pipes to pull everything from my social media to what I said online to the music I listened to into an online database. From 2010 to 2011, I morphed that out, grabbed everything I did at work, documents I created, money I spent, where I spent my time into that database, and I tied it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Between 2012 and 2014, I moved more of that data, everything from health, environment, and travel, into that database and started automating the world around me. Between 2015 and 2018, I started getting into Buddhism, uh, witchcraft, and using data to remix reality in front of me, including downloading and recreating memories from the data that I collected in my life. Now, I normally don't tell people that I'm remixing reality when they're visiting my house, but it gets them to leave quickly. For example, if, if people are at my house and it's a little bit late, I have the house slowly warm up till people are uncomfortable and leave. Now, <laughs> all sorts of little fun little things you can do with a connected home that look like witchcraft and act like witchcraft if you're uncomfortable hanging out with people. But there are really three forms of witchcraft that I personally perform. Uh, the first is called psychometry. Um, for about two years, I've been very public with traveling around the world. I have a booth and I ask people to see their phones, and I hold their phones, and I tell them about their lives from looking at their home screen. I can do this because what I've found is people will often put certain apps or, or design their home screens in certain ways so that it's very telling about the things they believe in or want to believe in. Very rarely will you see a healthy person with health apps not somewhere tied to their phone. Also, people who have that battery percentage turned on, freaks every single time. Um, it's just the way they roll. Who are my battery percentage people? It's usually half the room. Okay. Um, so what I found by doing this, this psychometry was this concept of suggestion. So being able to hold someone's device without opening anything and let them know things about their life. On Wednesday this week, I'll be talking about uh, chronoception. Uh, this is the second practice I do. So I use technology to time travel. And while it's a little difficult to explain without going into the whole hour, or I think it's two hours on Wednesday where I talk about this, um, basically it's the ability to change my perception of time by using digital feedback loops and or interfaces to make me speed up or slow down the current moment I'm in. We've all been there when you're waiting for something to hurry up. I basically just use a lot of technology to haste in that. And then finally, digital uh, sigils and scrying. So sigils are uh, a, a pagan or an occult type of uh, idea where you can create symbols or symb symb symbology to automatically assign certain values or things you want to manif manifest in the world. You guys call these emojis. 
what I do is I actually um, meditate on emojis that are tied to certain parts of my life. And then as I get that image in my head at the beginning of every moon cycle, I then use those images or those emojis in certain things, such as emails, if I want to make something or will something to happen, text messages, um, even I print them out and put them around the house. Those emojis then tie into reminders that are either geophysical geofences that I create and or time feedback loops that also tie into events in my life. Now, normally people just see a bunch of emojis in me uh, on my devices and things and think that's cute. They don't realize that I'm actually practicing a form of intention. How many of you use emojis to kind of get your point across to people? Because what we're finding is the use of emoji is reprogramming people around us, and it's reprogramming us. So again, I, I like to use these types of uh, tools. And then finally, I've built a, are you guys familiar with Airtable? Is that popular yet? I built a values database inside of Airtable and tied it back to those emojis so that I can automatically have real-time filtering of what's working and what's not working in my life. But magic, religion, and technology really tie together at a level that I think most people can't understand right now. When we think around some of the words that I've been exposed to in the last 30 years with technology, we have things like user experience, the term guru, um, the ability to control things remotely. Uh, data science is a lot like scrying. Scrying is just looking at something and, and finding uh, meaning in it. Um, energy projection probably would be the latest kind of fad that we're seeing with uh, wireless charging. Um, and I remember the first time someone said to me, can you bring that, uh, it was a SCO Unix, a, can you bring that SCO Unix server back up? And I said, you want me to resurrect it? And he said, yes. And I thought to myself, this is really, really creepy. Um, but to me, the easiest definition for uh, where religion and technology meet would be this concept that magic is really nothing more than open source religion. So for all of us who, who don't feel that we're religious or don't really understand technology completely or we have friends or family who might uh, proclaim that they're atheists, I always say if you're into the open source movement, movement, magic is the quickest place to go to get your fix. So systems and platforms of magic. There were three that I specifically want to highlight today. The first one are the knowledge systems of magic. Some of the earliest knowledge systems for con controlling and maintaining magic were pagans. These were people whose religious beliefs were outside of the norm. Um, they, felt, they felt that magic came from the world around them. They were influenced by fate and the experience of their history. From there, we went to the mages or magicians. That's a word from ancient Greek that actually meant magic. These people believed that magic came from books and learning. They were more deeply influenced by the emergence of institutions. They were influenced mainly by others, and they saw ritual or routine as power. If we move forward a little bit further in history, we get to the word wizard, which comes from the Middle English wis, meaning wise. These people believe that magic comes from a higher power, and they feel that they can influence their surroundings and that spirituality itself is the power. And then finally, there are sorcerers, uh, meaning, the, meaning to influence fate. These are magicians uh, who feel their magic comes from within. They can influence fate and time, and they are the merger of the spiritual and the organic. I bring this up because when you think about the types of things and the types of sensations that people are starting to have around technology, this idea of being able to influence fate keeps, I'd say, keeps emerging in a lot of the literature that I'm reading and a lot of the news headlines that I'm seeing. And it makes me wonder if we haven't conjured some type of global sorcery in our interconnectedness. These four knowledge systems are really tied to four uh, competing belief platforms. The first one being in line with the oldest, and that would be paganism itself. Paganism really was organized by fate where the understanding came from experience. It came from looking inward into the individual. From there, we moved on as a culture to something called monotheism. It was organized by the maker. Our understanding of that came from authority. To ascend, it was via instruction, and, we benef and it was to benefit the uh, platform itself. And you can think of some of the more modern religions. Finally, capitalism as a belief system was organized by economic power. Our understandings came from our culture. Ascension via consumption and benefit went to the system itself, not to the platform. And then finally, acceleration, accelerationism was uh, organized by behavior 
direction from understanding, ascension via behavior. So again, how you behave is how you compete in this belief platform. Benefits go to the developer, ironically enough. And we can see this in everything from China's new social ranking system to some of the earliest page rank and edge rank uh, scoring systems. So as we went from understanding the world around us and the, the seas inspired out to looking at authority uh, in modern uh, religions and then supplanting that by our consumerism, we can now see where behavior has become a plea for uh, belief platform. Those two things, the knowledge system and the belief platform, really collapse into three main temporal platforms that wrap around the same time frame. The first one being Greek. The Greeks had two types of time. Their first type of time was called Kairos. Kairos was the um, qu uh, qualitative, unordered uh, uh, nature of a system. It was that feeling you got that something was going to happen. Um, in the Bible, they refer to this as seasons. It was the season of war. It was the season to feed. The thing that's interesting about Kairos is that it's non-ordered. Uh, systems like coincidence live inside Kairos. Um, agrarians use uh, Kairos because of the nature of the seasons and growing. Um, the bias, uh, it it's really uh, centers around subjective bias. If we move out of Kairos, we get to the second type of Greek time, which was Kronos. And that's the time that everyone in this room, maybe everyone, um, actually functions on. And that was the quantitative order of minutes that spanned a mechanical system. So again, thinking around mechanical clocks, ordered linear time, it was very deterministic, scientific, industrial. Um, objective bias is really where the uh, Kronos uh, comes from. And we really got into this current time frame about 1300 AD. But I posit that we are actually in a new form of time yet to be defined called algorithmos, and that's what I'm calling it. Um, and this is algorithmos, it's really the emergent will of the merger of biological and mechanical systems. You can see this when you're waiting in uh, a large group of people. You can see emergent will within the time and how they actually use that time. The bias is systematic. You see it travel rapidly through systems. And I believe that it is a chaotic emergent experience that we're starting to notice. Again, you would have to strip away the two other forms of time for it to happen, but that's why I mentioned time in the beginning. I'm going to take a breath because I don't normally talk about this stuff out loud. But every time you say something new, you get excited. Any questions so far before I get into the kind of origins of techno magic and how it's influencing the world today? Are you guys enjoying this? It's probably like, what the hell? You'll, it, it, it's gonna get, we're gonna get home, but I, I literally had to take you guys through a bunch of systems to get you up to practicing magic very quickly, and it is hard to make 50 wizards in a, in a half an hour, but that's what we're gonna do. So the origins of techno magic, um, one of my favorite writers is Marshall McClellan, and he said, uh, many people simply resort to the occult ESP in every form of hidden awareness in response to this new, sur new surround of electronic information. And so we live in an extremely religious age, probably the most religious ever. We are already there. And I think if you were to look at the world today, you'd you could easily say it's probably one of the most spiritual times of all time. People are into rocks and scents and, you know, there's all sorts of things. So I thought I'd walk you guys through some of the last 30 years of kind of this institutionalization of religion and magic and technology. The earliest um, kind of techno religious spiritual object I could find was a U.S. patent from 1973 for a device to actually hone and pull in spirits uh, into this prismatic uh, creation that they had found. I don't know if it ever got made, but it's one hell of a patent to read. Um, in 1981, we can see the first uh, inklings of techno magic in the ads for email. They showed this magical beam coming out of a computer screen and taking over a person. From there, we go to 1991, when Microsoft introduced Microsoft Publisher. It was the first time that we used the word wizard or the concept of a setup wizard was introduced into the computer. By 1993, um, HP was uh, heralding this new world of computers that they called a second world, and you would use the computer uh, to span into that second world. Also, it was the first year that we had um, the Book of Shadows, which is an ancient occult text on a hypercard. Uh, by 1997, Wired Magazine had coined the phrase technopagan, 
uh, this idea that there was a, an emergent spirituality around the technology systems we were using. Anybody watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer? You remember Willow? Willow was a techno-pagan who used the computers to cast spells. By 2010, Unicode 6 gave us the crystal ball. Um, by 2010 also, a group of people in Sweden created copyism, which was a uh, religion around uh, sharing of information. Thank you, Sweden. I love Sweden. Um, 2013, Facebook started celebrating non, uh, well, I'd say more pagan like holidays. You'll see Facebook now celebrates all of those. By 2014, we'll see the emergence of meme magic, which we'll talk about in a minute. 2016 was the emergence of the witches of Instagram. If you haven't followed any of the witches of Instagram, check them out. It's worth having an Instagram account just for the witches of Instagram. Um, 2016 was also the first year I cast my first spell online. Uh, and what I did with that was I had to reset some passwords for some of my network users, so I would embed spells in the masked passwords I asked them to type in. Um, 2017 was an addition to the Unicode to get us five or six, I think there were six different magical beings that were entered, the most number of types of beings ever entered. By 2017, um, there was a lot more magical spells happening online, and finally, 2018, we're doing those. But I want to jump to meme magic for a second. People love to show you Google search trends. So if you searched for, for black magic on Google right now, worldwide between 2013 and 2018, you'll see some interesting spikes here. Is anybody familiar with the concept of meme magic? Some of you? So it, it's, there's a lot to meme magic, but basically the, the, at a very distilled level, passing around of memes is a way to infect a culture with certain ideology and therefore control the narrative around something. And almost the day that we had this spike in black magic, Donald Trump tweeted that he was going to start running uh, for the president of the United States, which, again, uh, I was shocked by some of the research myself, but I thought to myself, well, it just must be coincidence that there was this meme that was going to make him president, uh, and then he tweets. And by the way, back then, he wasn't even serious. It was all kind of, he was thinking about doing this. But by the fall of 2015, the memes with Donald Trump started being passed around online, and by the winter of 2017, we have another spike when Alana Del Rey came out and said she was going to cast a spell over him to control him. So there's a very serious linkage between the magic that's happening in the real world and how things are being exercised online. But it's not just there. If we go back and look at Apple, in 2009, they introduced the Magic Mouse. By 2010, the Magic Trackboard, Trackpad. By 2015, the Magic Keyboard. By 2017, the Magic Keyboard went dark. And today, if you search the Apple Store, you will find a Black Magic EPU. E GPU, the only black magic item in the uh, Apple uh, store, which I think is just outrageously interesting through a magical lens. Keeping with the magical lens in our devices, if we look at the MacBook, the latest Mac Mojave actually embraces what they call a dark mode, and the wallpaper is actually something they call dynamic, so it actually shifts and gives you a sense of seasonality or time throughout the day. Again, creating this illusion of light and dark within the interface itself. Not to be outdone, this week Microsoft announced they will ship a light operating system just for people who don't want to live on the dark side. But who are these techno-pagans that I speak of? Are they you? Are they me? Well, the first thing is we don't have stores like regular, peg, like regular technicians. Uh, we don't have uh, special devices. We use everyday devices just like you guys. We just use them a little bit differently. I like to describe techno-pagans as an evolution from the, from the original geek. Um, the geek gave rise to the quantified self, which was the geek who experimented on himself. The quantified self gave rise to the cyborg, which is really about the biohacker who was into cutting or changing his physical life. The biohacker gave rise to the transhuman, who was really into life extension or immorality, immortality or immorality. And then finally, the life hacker gave rise to the consciousness hacker, which got us to this conference theme I think we're experiencing right now through no sheer coincidence. So where do we find techno-pagans? Well, if you look carefully around the world, 
you're going to start to see there are a lot of interesting mergers of technology and nature. Go to any IKEA, any type of uh, gadget store, you're starting to see more and more of these mergers of the biological, organic, and technology. But what I like to tell people is techno-pagans are everywhere. You see them in coffee shops, you see them on, on, on buses, you even see them on donkeys with solar panels. But what do we believe? Well, techno-pagans believe that uh, in art and fashion, you can find the influence of techno-paganism almost everywhere you look in the world, from the cursors that we use to the symbology that we use to create and connect to each other. It's kind of hard not to see the magic in technology once you start to look for it. By the way, you all are going to be so freaked out tonight. Just telling you, this is the way this works. You're going to go in and deep. Um, but if we were to actually look at the difference between these specific genres, you've got magic, which is what we're here to talk about today, and that's really to control the natural and other types of phenomena. From there, you've got religion. Religion was to explain the natural and other types of phenomena. Science came along to explain the natural phenomena itself, and of course, we've got technology to control the natural phenomena. But as we go through time, what we'll see is as these disciplines start to move closer to the present time, you reach this point called the singularity. No matter whether you're talking about technology, science, religion, or magic, every single discipline has a singularity. And that is the sense that you all are feeling now when you're in the world and overwhelmed by things. We're approaching a biological, technological singularity, not like Ray Kurzweil, but more of a spiritual uh, singularity. I met Ray Kurzweil in 2012 and shared with him some of the things I was thinking around this, and Ray Kurzweil told me I was crazy. If Ray Kurzweil thinks you're crazy, you're doing something right, because Ray Kurzweil is pretty out there. Um, the other thing about techno-pagans is we communicate through code. I found this great example of Objective C and the Kabbalah uh, Tree of Life and the arrangement of the classes. I thought that was pretty compelling. Um, also, in code now, uh, we, you can find developers who are actually putting in human states, so the desire to make someone pause in real life for a moment before they do something else, which reminds me of one of my, famous, uh, one of my favorite quotes about techno technology and magic, and that's, the instruments of power are usually made by those who wish to uh, seek it. Finally, we've got the concept of possession. Uh, really, in the beginning, it was about us moving the magical devices that controlled the other world. Then it was about those devices watching our movements. And of course, we all know that now those devices are watching us, and it makes you wonder who's the puppet, who's the puppeteer. We communicate in ways, like I said earlier, with emoji. Uh, we now have different tribes using different versions of emoji. I like to call them our digital tribes. Uh, we even have magic words. I love this one, rents do. What's the magic word? Eviction, Apple Pay, and money materializes out of nowhere. Just like that, we are active. You'll see uh, techno-pagans everywhere. But you need to look no further than the rituals of magic to really get your head around what's happening. Technology, every time we create a piece, creates a ritual. It's hard to see someone using a piece of technology in an unritualistic unreal, fashion. It just goes one hand in the other, which makes you wonder when they designed the phone, did they know that people would do this or did they think that it, uh, it would create a system that did this? Some of the rituals going back, we've got clicker casting for those of you who are old enough to remember your remote at home. Uh, you've got touch, touch, screen, touch screen gestures, um, the idea of periscoping or remote viewing. Uh, the idea of waving at sensors to make things happen, um, conversation generators, so using devices to bring people in to conversations, kicking uh, devices, uh, and also the uh, shaking or blowing on devices. All of these rituals come from the act that the device was uh, created in the first place. But more than practice rituals, we also create one. If you're in technology, you know for a fact that the USB was the original fourth dimension device because you could plug it in one way, then plug it in the next, and then plug it in and you achieve superposition. No other piece of technology has achieved superposition quite like USB. And this is because it is a magical item. It was one of the first magical items that were created so that we could go ahead and take control and move the magic from place to place. Back in my day, we used to glue the USB holes close. And not only do we create rituals, but we share rituals. All you have to do is go to YouTube, and you'll see that ritualistic sharing of technology has become omnipresent. 
go back. I mean, unboxing videos are probably the most high pagan ritual priest act you can create, and there are millions of people doing them every single day. Flying carpets are magic, but when you can buy one, it becomes technology, Scott Westerfield said in 2016. So what are some things you can do? Well, the first thing I like to think about when we think about technology and magic is the idea of communicating with others through technology, and that's really creating an interface to synchronicity. So the design goal with uh, designing an interface to synchronicity would be to design an interface that will captivate a user by creating some curiosity. Curiosity is where will meets intent. If you have just will, you won't get something done. If you have just intent, you won't get something done. But where will meets intent, curiosity can live, and you can have a user do something. So what are some methods you can do to get someone to achieve an objective? Well, I feel that there are just three kind of main ones. The first one would be create a sense of time or time travel um, that leaves someone in a different state than they were in originally. And I'm going to walk you through an example of something I built in 2014. Uh, this was an application we built, me and a small team, called Existence. The idea of existence was people were getting stuck on their phones and it was really hard for them to break away and we wanted them to be able to see their lives differently without overburdening them with you, you should be standing up or being active. The first thing we did was we created a stack of really six different uh, data points. Time being the uh, pervasive one, location, behavior, biology, calendar, environment. These were the elements that we collected from the device, and then we displayed them on a map that you could rotate with your finger left or right and zoom into everything from sunrises to sunsets to when's the last time you listened to a piece of music. But we didn't stop there. We created a timeline for this behavior, and the timeline allowed you to pull backward and see everything you'd done throughout the day. We allowed people to pull forward and see anything that was in their music queue, on their calendar, or weather. So it was the first application that we designed that allowed people to really go backward and forward in time. The other thing we did was we allowed them to filter it by behavior. The idea was we wanted to be able to influence people to start to have better habits. By filtering the, these uh, uh, data points, it allowed people to see their life at a very quick level the way they were experiencing it, because sometimes you're all on your head, sometimes you're all on your body. Uh, and then finally, as I stated earlier, the jump to now, future or past button was one of our most popular features. But we didn't stop there. Once we understood what these users were doing, we introduced these cards. There were four types of cards to slowly change the user's uh, behavior. The first one were memories, where we would take photos from the user's photo roll and augment them from the data from that day. So if you'd taken a picture, we wouldn't just show you the picture, we'd show you the weather and a little bit about your biological state that day. The second thing we did was around um, metrics. So we took anything you'd done kind of that was a goal for yourself and really showed you how that week was spent. We then took those milestones, which were groups of goals that were really positively changed behaviors and shared those with you. And then finally, moments. And moments were aware where we took something that was a behavior we didn't want someone to practice, and we reminded them of something they did want to practice. And an example of that was we wanted to teach people not to text and drive. So what we did was we shoved moments into people's lives if they drove and didn't text and drive. So we didn't tell people when they were texting and driving, don't do this. We waited till they'd made at least one or two trips without picking up their phones, and then gave them a message about just positive, positive things. The ability not to nag someone and to actually reward positive behavior without pointing at negative behavior made the, uh, the um, distracted driving drop by 75%. So basically what we were doing were we were rewarding people. We had a dashboard in the background that I called the Mag Magician Portal, and the Magician Portal allowed us to take these data points from people's devices and start to remix them, introduce these cards into people's lives. It was kind of over the top. This company got sold to a healthcare company. If you're in America and you use healthcare, someone's probably practicing magic on you that we created in 2014.
The, last, uh, the, the second to last one is transmuting ritual. The transmuting ritual is really about creating habit through organizing a person's life and behaviors uh, of passive data. A good example of transmuting ritual would be a GPS that takes you on a route that you haven't been on before. Right? So you, you always want the fastest way, but there might be times when you want someone to go a different way. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this very quickly so we can get to the last one, so we can because the last one's going to be a lot of fun. But the idea here was uh, collecting information passively, applying a matrix of algorithms to that to determine what that fingerprint moment is, applying a trigger to send the information back to the person in a unique way, filtrating it so you don't get a message while they're in the middle of hanging out with a friend, um, and then sending it back to someone's life in the form of an, an ambient alert, meaning from the home or body, and then uh, looking at it through some analytics. I'm not going to go into all these right now, but I'll send you the slides. Uh, but there are a lot of things you can do with this around everything from greater good to personal good to health and safety. Last but not least, because I am out of time, I'm sorry I went so long, would be the idea of uh, fortune telling. So the idea that here is I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about what I do when I do iPhone palmistry so you can start to do it with yourselves. But the, what I'd like you to be able to do is when you leave here today, be able to trade phones with someone tonight, look at their phone, and tell them a little bit about their life without actually like, bugging them just to see how close you get. These are the areas that I use. If you want to snap a picture of this, you can. That I look at someone's phone, and I look for these attributes on the phone, like when I mentioned uh, the battery signal. Um, I sometimes look at the type of case someone has. They have a, a soft case or a hard case, no case. Uh, do they have a screen protector? Um, are they pro-notification badge or anti-notification badge? That has a lot to do with resiliency. Um, do they have any alarms or, or shortcuts uh, on their phone? Keyboard shortcuts are a really telltale sign, people who use those. Um, have they moved all the icons to one side or another? Real, real crazy things, like some people keep the default screen. So I thought we'd end today with just one exercise. So, Someone submitted this screen to me on Twitter today and said, I want you to read my phone. So what do you guys see in this person? Uh, just yell out your answer, and then I'll show you, I'll, I'll tell you what I read by looking at their phone. What'd you say? Yeah. Anyone else want to make any guesses about what this person is like in their life? Their what? Practical? Yep, yeah, I would get totally practical out of this. Why do you say practical? Exactly, exactly. Very good. We need to hang out. Who else? Well, who? Yeah, I'd say health conscious. Commuting? Commuter? Yeah. Spiritual? Yeah, I would definitely say spiritual. So these, this, is what I, this is what I read. I actually sent this back to him on Twitter. You're someone who believes in the poss uh, in, in possibility. Uh, you don't see a separation between success at work and your personal health. You remember by listening. Uh, you don't have to do things. You just retain them the moment you hear them. You actively seek to control the knowledge in your life at all costs. You dream of spending all your time traveling. There are moments in your life where people have turned their back on you, probably a family member. Thrill rides don't thrill you. You're probably thinking, how did you get that? So do you see the guy down in the home bar doing the, uh, the uh, push-up? Basically, people get bullied on beaches. And this is someone who's basically being kicked in the face with sand. Right? That's what I see. Guess what? He had this happen to him. See, we create, even if it's a health icon, we create the memories and feelings in the imageries that we put on our phones. The elephant of Evernote, he remembers everything. He doesn't have to do it, he just knows it. The icons that surround a settings icon are the things you seek to control in your life. Money, knowledge, being more of a listener than a talker. Next one, and then we'll end with this one. Who wants to take a guess on this guy? Religious, that's the first thing I thought too. Or you can just tell me what feelings you're getting from this guy's home screen. I'm sorry, it is a guy. I think it is. I don't know. about that. Somebody tweeted it to me. He works in economics. That's a good one. Who said that? You? 
Anyone else? Come on, what, what feeling are you getting looking at it? Pretend you can see him. What, what, what are you feeling right here? Boring? Yeah? Who, who got boring? All right, yeah, all right. All right, this is, this is what I said. The, the storms of life have tested your world and often have lasted for years. You've built several projects that were taken over the demands in your life and you want to go back to them. You find comfort in the lack of control in nature. Real news comes from how you feel about things, not what's happening, and people never leave your mind once you meet them. Where did I get that from? So again, he's not into money. So the stock apps is like lightning over the planet, which is a lack of control. Whenever you see the stock apps on the screen for someone who's not financially driven, they are someone who literally lives in chaos. Um, they don't, those types of people don't move it. Who's got the stock icon on their home screen? We should just, no, well, I won't call you out. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, do you see how the bird is hanging out by the, uh, the settings? So that, that was the whole being respectful of nature. And then finally, last but not least, you don't have to do this one, but I think this is really interesting. Sometimes the icons on your home screen will spell out a word. Did you ever notice like Facebook is an F? Look at your phone or look at your partner's phone or your friend's phone. You'll probably see a lot of words spelled out on screens. Often they're names of people they know. They just don't know it. They're like, I didn't know I was spelling a word. It's crazy. And then finally, look at the apps covering the faces, throats, and stomachs of people. The apps covering those places on people's pictures are usually the concern you have for that person. Yeah. Oh, well, last rule of digital magic, don't forget to run your spell checker. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning.